man, with all the coronavirus talk about coronavirus this, coronavirus that, Trump this, Trump that, I figure, you know what? Let's just take a break from all that for just one day, right? And I actually want to talk a little bit about the, I want to call it the other side of the coronavirus, right? Or the other side of the COVID-19 epidemic. And this is something that I feel a lot of people aren't really appreciating or understanding. And let's kind of break it down a little bit. First off, I just want to say a big shout out and a big thank you to all the people who are working tirelessly and effortlessly to get this disease under control, right? For example, the people who work at our grocery stores, right? We don't really, we, and honestly, I'll say, I'll straight up say it, we take them for granted. The people who work at Vaughn, Safeway, Kroger's, Trader Joe's, Costco, Whole Foods, just all of those people who are working tirelessly to make sure that we have food, right? We have food, we have toilet paper, we have sanitizer, we have water, we have snacks. Every day, day in, day out, they're always filling up the shelves to make sure that people like you, people like me, normal citizens are well fed and taken care of. So I wanna say a big shout out to you people who do that stuff for us every single day. And most people don't realize is that they are putting themselves essentially at risk of working as well because they're constantly dealing with, you know, different people day in, day out, hourly, you know, doing that. And so we should learn to appreciate those people, right? The second group of people that I want to acknowledge are the frontline workers. These are primarily your nurses, your doctors, um, your technicians, and you know, we're all a team. Me being a physical therapist, unfortunately, we're not able to really utilize our skills at this time, but I promise you people that the minute everyone gets healthy, the minute all of our senior population are out of the hospital or people are just in the hospital who get out of the hospital, rest assured that the physical therapy, the occupational therapy, and the overall allied health team will make sure that everyone gets healthy again. We're gonna work on your recovery, we're gonna work on your rehab, just everything like that, okay? And actually, I wanted to share a story with you about a particular incident uh, that happened in Italy a couple of, couple of days ago. Hey, sorry about that. So I wanted to go and just do a re-recording of that video because I was, I was kind of reviewing it. My dog just kept barking and barking. It was kind of interfering with this the way I was telling my story and I don't want to, I want to give this person credit and I want to tell the story right. Anyways, uh, I'm going to try and read this word for word. So I apologize if I'm not looking at the camera as I'm reading this. So basically there is an ICU physician over at the, over at the country of uh, Bergano, Italy. And he goes by the name of Dr. Daniel Mancini. So Dr. Mancini gives us his insights on what it's like to be at the front lines, particularly dealing with this significant outbreak that's going on in Italy. And if you haven't heard about the news lately, uh, there's, a, there's a big amount of this mortality rate going on because of Italy is considered the number two in the, in the world as far as like how many senior citizens they have in that country. And so because of that, a lot of people are, you know, actually under critical care and all that. It's, 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 it's a horrible situation they're, they're dealing with right now. Um, so anyways, I kind of want to go ahead and give this detailed story about how this doctor is dealing with uh, being in the front line. Okay, so check this out. After much thought about whether and what to write about what is happening to us, I felt that silence was not responsible. I will therefore try to convey to people far from our reality what we are living in, Bergano, in these days of the COVID-19 pandemic. I understand the need to not create panic, but when a message of the dangerousness of what is happening does not reach the people, I shudder. I myself watched with some amazement the reorganization of the entire hospital in the past week. When our current enemy was still in the shadows, the wards slowly emptied. Elective activities were interrupted. Intensive care were freed up to create as many beds as possible. All this rapid transformation brought an atmosphere of silence and surreal emptiness to the corridors of the hospital that we did not yet understand. Waiting for a war that was yet to begin and that many, including me, were not so sure would ever come back with such ferocity. I still remember my night call a week ago when I was waiting for the results of a swab. When I think about it, my anxiety over one possible case seems almost ridiculous and unjustified. Now that I've seen what's happening, well, the situation now is dramatic to say the least. The war has literally exploded and battles are uninterrupted, day and night. 
But now that need for beds has arrived in all its drama, one after the other, the departments that had been emptied suddenly fill up at an impressive pace. The boards with the names of the patients of different colors, depending on the operating unit, are now all red. And instead of surgery, you see the diagnosis, which is always the damn same, bilateral interstitial pneumonia. Now explain to me which flu virus causes such a rapid drama. And while there are still people who boast of not being afraid by ignoring directions, protesting because their normal routine is temporarily put in crisis, the epidemiological disaster is taking place. And there are no more surgeons, urologists, orthopedists. We are only doctors who suddenly become part of a single team to face this tsunami that has overwhelmed us. Cases are multiplying. We arrive at a rate of 15 to 20 admissions per day, all for the same reason. The result of the swabs now come one after the other. Positive, positive, positive. Suddenly, the ER is collapsing. Reasons for the access always the same. Fever and difficulty breathing. Fever and cough. Respiratory failure. Radiology reports always the same. Bilateral interstitial pneumonia. Bilateral interstitial pneumonia. Bilateral interstitial pneumonia. All to be hospitalized. Someone already to be intubated and go to intensive care. For others, it's too late. Every ventilator becomes like gold. Those in operating theaters that have now suspended their non-urgent activity become intensive care places that did not exist before. The staff is exhausted. I saw the tiredness on faces that didn't know what it was despite the already exhausting workloads they had. I saw a solidarity of all of us. Who never failed to go to our internist colleagues to ask, what else can I do for you? Doctors who move beds and transfer patients, who administer therapies instead of nurses, nurses with tears in their eyes because we can't save everyone, and the vital parameters of several patients at the same time reveal an already marked density. There are no more shifts, no more hours. Social life is suspended for us. We no longer see our families for fear of infecting them. Some of us have already become infected despite the protocols. Some of our colleagues who are infected also have infected relatives and some of their relatives are already struggling between life and death. So be patient. You can't go to the theater, museums, or the gym. Try to have pity on the myriad of old people you could possibly exterminate. We just try to make ourselves useful. You should do the same. We influence the life and death of a few dozen people. You with yours, many more. Please share this message. We must spread the word to prevent what is happening here from happening all over Italy. I finish by saying that I don't really understand this war on panic. The only reason I see is mask shortages, but there's no mask on sales anymore. We don't have a lot of studies, but is it a panic really worse than neglect and carelessness during an epidemic of this sort? Th that's a story. And it's funny, I mean, I mean, when I was reading this, I was actually getting kind of emotional actually, just cause you could feel that intensity. And I realized, you know, I'm, I'm guilty of this. You know, I'm sure, you know, a lot, many of us have where it's like we're complaining about our lives right now, just like not being able to go out, not being able to see our friends, not being able to go to restaurants, go to the bars, go to the gyms, go to the theaters, like everything is closed, you know, like, and sometimes we just forget the other side of what people have to deal with. You know what I mean? And I can't imagine, I was talking to a couple of my friends, uh, one's a doctor, uh, my stepmom's a nurse, and I've been talking to uh, another friend who's a nurse, and I ask them like, how, like, how's work for you? And they're saying, oh, it's fine. You know, they're still doing their normal routine. They're still nursing at the pediatric unit. They're still doing a normal nurse routine for whatever department they're assigned to. My friend who's a, who's a doctor is still doing surgery, but I can't imagine, and hopefully this does not happen to us. I really don't. Because can you imagine when all of a sudden we have an outbreak of just 
people flooding into the hospital and all of a sudden you're working the front line you know the nurses the doctors the, the other healthcare staff i'm sorry if i'm excluding the people that who are helping you know you all of a sudden you're put in that situation what do i do there's this inflow of just constantly sick people coming in coming in coming in and it's like and they're all you know various ages some are older some may be younger and at some point you have to decide who gets to live and who gets to die and that that becomes challenging right like how do you determine based off of like you know their prior level of not prior history are they more like a pro general prognosis are they younger are you gonna say someone who's like five years younger than someone who's eight you know in their five years older it's just how do you deal with all that and so I, I just wanted to share this story with you because of how how profound it had to me and it got me to really realize and understand that you know not many of us probably have the grasp of what really is going on you know we still say that uh, we're young we're fine we're not affected but again it's about having compassion for those who are at risk those people who are sick or who can become sicker and potentially die at such a uh episodic rate or sorry um is that the right word i'll just use that word episodic rate is constantly growing and okay and i guess that's want to emphasize again that you know our lives may suck right now you know but we're let's all work together to make sure that our grandparents you know people who are immune compromised people with asthma people with just respiratory diseases they stay safe they stay healthy so we got to do something what's called herd immunity right where if one person's um at risk we got to make sure that we all work as a team to make sure that this particular person doesn't get a team i mean it's primarily with works with like the, the vaccines for example um but anyways same same rhetoric right tomorrow i'm actually going to do a video about the positive effects of what's going on as a result of the coronavirus. So really look out for that. And I'm, I'm really excited to talk about that. And, and again, just sorry if this was a really emotional story, but I, I really want to get this sh shared so that we learn to, again, just empathize and to show compassion for these people to our grandparents, to our loved ones, or people who are just, who can be at high risk of mortality because of the COVID-19 or the coronavirus. I'd rather use COVID-19 now, it's more professional will say anyways you continue to be safe you know continue to practice your appropriate hygiene and just yeah take care of yourself and until then i'll see you tomorrow look forward to it